our executive director, Sam Fletcher. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We are so happy to see you here. And I see many of our friends coming in the room that join us for many of our events that we have throughout the year. So it's so good to see you all and everyone is welcome. I'm so happy we have people from across the country here tonight. I just wanna start by saying that abortion and reproductive rights are basic human rights and that uh, women and childbearing people should have autonomy over their own bodies. This is a social work issue. It doesn't matter what you believe personally, professionally, our profession of social work demands that we work to ensure rights for abortion and for reproduction and for people to have autonomy over themselves. I wanna thank you again for joining us tonight and we look forward from hearing from you and also from learning from you about all the ways that we can better support you as we begin this fight to earn these rights back for everyone in our country. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our facilitator tonight who has been on our board for several years and is a very active member of the New York State chapter, Afsha Malik, and she's representing the National Advocates for Pregnant Women tonight. So welcome Afsha, thank you. Thank you, Sam and Amelia, for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone. Good morning to folks that are in different time zones. Uh, my name is Afsha, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and like Sam had said, I am a research and program associate with National Advocates for Pregnant Women. Um, so we are um, an organization based in New York City that works on reproductive justice issues. Um, so before I give a more in-depth detail about um, you know, the organization that I work for um, and provide a landscape of what's been going on, um, I just want to do um, a land acknowledgement um, and acknowledge the land that we are all occupying. Um, so I work and reside on Merrick land um, and understand that many of us can be either in Lona Bay land, which is in Manhattan, or in other types of occupied and stolen land across the country. Um, this is important um, to acknowledge that the land we are, um, especially in the context of what we're going to be talking about tonight, um, which is the fight and the um, work around reproductive justice and reproductive rights, which is directly connected, like Sam said, to all human rights um, and the movement for indigenous rights. So I want to urge folks to take um, a look and um, you know discover what lands they may be on and donate or see if there are ways that they can support their local um, brothers and sisters on that land. Um, so a little bit about National Advocates for Pregnant Women. So we are a combined legal advocacy, public education, and organizing um, organization, nonprofit based in New York. Um, and we basically fight to preserve the rights and the um, humanity of people that are being criminalized or targeted for behavior while they are pregnant or their pregnancy outcome. Um, so this typically includes women of color, low income women, um, and women that uh, use uh, drugs or are engaged in using substances. Um, and we um, basically focus mostly on people that are in the criminal system. So the people that we typically work with are people that have or attempt to have an abortion across the country, um, people that experience a pregnancy loss, either a miscarriage or a stillbirth, people that are experiencing pregnancy, labor, and birth, and people that use al alcohol or drugs. Um, many of our clients um, face an array of charges based on what may be happening at any stage of their pregnancy, not limited to, um, but murder, manslaughter, criminal child neglect, abuse, chemical engagement, um, and a, a, a lot of other hosts of, of charges that I won't get into because that's not um, what we're going to really focus on tonight. Um, but I wanted to just give you kind of a quick uh, 
preface to where I'm coming from, my organization, um, and the work that we do in addition to abortion, but promoting reproductive rights for the clients that we work with. Um, so one thing um, that I want to talk about quickly before I kind of start the conversation of Roe and um, make sure we're all at the same page and then open up dialogue is um, a little pointer about the language and the, the choices I'm gonna be using around language. Um, so typically you may hear me talk um, and say pregnant people, people with capacity for pregnancy, um, and that is to acknowledge um, and honor that there are people that may not identify specifically as a woman that can get pregnant and um, have reproductive um, capabilities. Um, and so want to expand that definition to uplift that as well. Um, so let's talk about why we're all here today. And thank you, um, everyone, everyone again for joining us. So last year, um, there was a court challenge that had come up to the attention of the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, and this was a case that came out of Mississippi. Um, the case name was Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health um, Organization. Um, and this was a case that essentially the respondent was challenging Mississippi's law that banned abortion after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Um, and so Jackson Women's Health Organization at the time was the only one clinic in Mississippi that was providing abortion services um, to folks. Um, this case got the attention of the Supreme Court of the United States because of this issue of if a 15 week abortion ban is legal or illegal um, and this idea of viability. Um, so the, the Supreme Court decided to take that issue um, and hear it and briefs and amicus briefs were due last November, October. Um, June 24th, I'm sure as most, most of you have known, um, the, the Supreme Court shared its opinion on the decision and they ruled on two things. They essentially, the issue was about the 15 week abortion ban. Um, they ruled that that was legal for the state to impose. And they also ruled that Roe v. Wade was not the law of the land anymore. Um, and that this was something that states could um, basically decide, uh, decide for, their, um, for their residents. And it wasn't a constitutional right for all citizens in uh, the United States to have the access to abortion. Um, so basically for the first time in the nation, the Supreme Court took a right from American citizens after 50 years of precedent, specifically in this case. Um, so what has happened after that um, have been several things. So one of those things is um, this, um, basically a lot of states before Roe was passed uh, had abortion bans. And many of those with the passage of Roe um, that basically protected this constitutional right for all people um, had had nullified the, those those bans. Um, so after this decision was placed, um, a lot of states had immediate um, total bans um, that came back into effect. So as of today, there are a lot of states that have restrictions on abortion bans. So right now, uh, total abortion bans with very limited exceptions are in effect in seven states. Um, abortion is currently banned at six weeks in three states. Um, there are criminalization based on abortion that's happening in a variety of states. Um, and then there's also um, a lot of conversation about um, and a conversation about um, different things that may happen in pregnancy and what should be criminalized or not criminalized. Um, so that's where we're at today with the context of the fall of Roe, the lack of protections of Roe. Um, and so now a lot of reproductive justice organizations um, are trying to focus on what to do now to help pr protect and promote the rights of, of their patients um, with reproductive uh, capabilities. So I want to open it up to everyone um, to first, you know, if folks have questions, um, but mostly we want this to be a town hall style and open the space for how folks are processing what has been coming up first for them, either per personally or professionally with what they've been either seeing on the news, what's been happening maybe in their personal lives. Um, 
and and see you know where where we go from there um the town hall we really want it to be a, an area where we can community build and share resources um and it like amelia had said at the beginning it can be really heavy um, especially because there's a lot of layers to this um so if folks need to separate or do whatever they need to take care um please do that um, so I'm going to I'm going to stop taking space, um, but if folks want to kind of jump in with how the last couple of weeks have been for them um, or their organizations, um, I'd love to uplift that. And you can also, uh, you don't have to raise your hand, you can come off my uh, mic as well and um, just jump in. Okay, hi folks. Uh, my name is Felix, I use they, them pronouns. Um, I usually am one of like the first people to jump into conversation. So I tried to give space for anyone who to jump in first, but. I'll take the first bite. Um, so background for me, I practice as a psychotherapist in the Capital District in New York. Um, I primarily work with queer and trans people um, and do a lot of work in my individual practice with like anti-capitalism and anti-racism and liberation framework, systemic oppression, stuff like that. And I tend to attract a very specific type of client, um, which means for ever, ever, like essentially immediately since the, the, the draft leaked a couple of months ago, many conversations have just been like, well, we wait, I'm afraid to get pregnant. I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of um, all of these things happening. Um, so it's definitely been really heavy on me personally as a clinician, though I think that my, the work that I'm doing is really important. And I do, I know I do individual micro work, but I do think that macro work is really important. I like to think that the work that I'm doing is setting my clients up to have the capacity for systemic change in their own lives um, so that they can go out and do things on like bigger grand scheme things. And some of my clients are really doing that. I mean, the, the thing that I definitely want to bring up is, you know, as a, as a trans clinician, to trans clients, the urgency for some of my clients to now get hysterectomies when they maybe would have waited for a while is pretty intense. Um, and I think that's something that we're, at least I'm going to see, and anybody else who is working with um, trans people who can get pregnant um, is like the utilization of gender affirming care to protect themselves from this kind of harm. Um, Cause we all know that it's pretty difficult for like, um, for women to just go to their doctor and get sterilized. But sometimes folks who are trans have access to things like hysterectomies for gender affirming reasons that also happen to mean you can't get pregnant. It's kind of very much a two birds, uh, one stone type thing. Um, but I um, am, a majority of my conversations are about the fear around the domino effect of things happening. And I think that's, that's where I get really conflicted about how I want to handle things because I live in New York. So the reality is if, um, so Roe v. Wade already fell. My abortion rights are relatively protected as of now. Um, my, if um, gay marriage falls, that's still protected in New York. If sodomy laws fall, that's still protected in New York. So in New York, it's a little bit different. We do have legal protections, but at the same time, we don't actually know the ways in which our legal system is going to, um, try to um, 
dismantle some of the individual state rights and protections that people have. So I don't feel comfortable telling my clients, we will never, you will never have to worry about gay marriage. You will never have to worry about your right to abortion because I really honestly don't know. And I have to give this like really nuanced talk and like psychoeducation with my clients. And I think that's where the fear is because I mean, in my personal life, life I'm like, okay, how do I get a hysterectomy as fast as I can? Am I supposed to be marrying my fiance now? Because in two years, will that be available to me? Like all of these things, I'm, I'm thinking about it. My clients are thinking about it. And it's kind of like a giant, like sw- all of us are swimming in the, the, in the sadness right now. And I don't really have anything else to say about it. Just that it's the uncertainty is really what is getting me right now in a lot of ways. Thank you. Thank you so much, Felix, for like sharing all of that. You talk, touched on a lot of things and also like your vulnerability and, you know, your personal like experiences and what's been happening at work as well. Um, so I, I agree with you completely. There's a lot of unknown. And I think a lot of us folks, um, I think folks can agree that, um, you know, people are taking it day by day. Um, and there's not a lot of answers, which which is really, which is really devastating. Um, for folks that may not be aware, so what Felix had mentioned um, about not knowing what legal protections as a country we may have um, and not being able to like, um, say for sure like if gay marriage will always be on the books um this is coming from and a lot of this justified fear is coming from the opinion that was released uh two weeks ago um in the one of the concurring opinions from um justice thomas um where legal terms are start started decisis i believe but basically this idea of that we should look back on some of these um other older decisions um like gay marriage, um, contraceptive use, and there was another one that I can't remember at the top of my head. Um, my head, um, but basically, hear those, hear about those cases again, um, because if we're using the arguments of Roe and taking Roe off the books, then you know that those arguments could apply to the, these landmark decisions as well, and these rights can possibly be at risk as well. Um, so there's a lot. So there's a lot of that's going on, right? And Felix, you're talking about uh, talking about that, which is a really important point, which leads to how this is such an intersectional issue, and it touches on a lot of different social issues are, uh, as well. So, people with identities that are more likely going that are going to be sanctioned by a state to lead to oppression or criminalization are going to be targeted. Um, so, trans folks, people. Um, uh, Black or brown identity, people that are ind- indigenous, um, those are the people that are going to be impacted with care, medical care, um, in the criminal system, in the in the family system. Um, so, you know, um, I, there's no like affirming words that I really have, um, but I I thank you for the intersectional lens and uplifting that because I think that's something that we need to to um, you know, make sure we are centering as well in this discussion. Um, do folks resonate or, you know, has anything come up with folks after Felix has shared in terms of fear that's coming up either personally for them or for their patients, um, either at the mi- micro level, which is really important, or in other levels as well? Because um, I think that's that's really valid and that that's a part of the process and that's what's been happening. Um, Hi, um, I'm Brenda from Kentucky, originally from upstate New York and Huntington, Long Island, woo woo. Um, anyway, uh, I know Kentucky has a vision of biddles, spittles and hound dogs and hillbillies, but I promise we're trying to do our best to keep as many things moving. One of the things or two of the things that we're doing here, and I really encourage everyone to look at this because I think this is a united front, is we are looking at our child abuse um, and neglect definitions as well as our human trafficking definitions. Our AG is an asshole. Um, he's Mitch McConnell's pet and he is pushing, he's, a, he's in charge of the um, human trafficking here in Kentucky. We are the seventh highest state in human trafficking with an increase in children being trafficked sexually by their parents. So what we've done 
is um, set out with um, ACLU and Planned Parenthood and a lot of partners looking at the definitions and regulations and, and pushing those and holding those against the people in our state who are fighting against reproductive access and rights. Um, in Kentucky, again, there's all kinds of misconceptions, but there's a lot of people, including our amazing governor, who are really working hard to make sure that we have, we continue to keep the stays that we have in the constitutional amendment. But I encourage everybody to use those child abuse and neglect um, statutes, as well as the human trafficking definitions, use them against like in states like Texas and other states that are fighting against this, because I think this may give us a little bit of pull right now. But I'm just really honored to be on here. I'm off camera because I've, um, I'm in my pajamas. I'll just be honest. So it's just a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Holly Lucader. I'm in Joplin, Missouri. Um, you know, Missouri is the first state that in, enacted that tr the trigger laws. Um, and I work for the state. I work for Children's Division. I have for nine years. And I'm really struggling personally, like working for the state that has enacted these laws. But then I also, you know, this is this is my livelihood. This is my income. It's my profession. You know, I um, when I first started, I never dreamed that nine years later I would still be working for Children's Division. You know, but it, it it's my thing that I that I'm good at. I'm really good at it. You know. Um, I'm concerned, you know, for my clients. Um, I have cli I have had clients who um, have had children come into state's custody and then they have become pregnant and they've chosen to have a, an abortion, you know, and I and I have supported them 100%. And, you know, they were worried about the courts finding out, you know, and I, I let them know that that is not something that I need to put in a court report. That is not something, you know, that everyone needs to know. Um, I'm concerned for my own daughter who has infertility issues and, you know, my 11 year old granddaughter, um, you know, what if she was raped? Um, I'm just, I'm lots of concern, lots of, you know, struggling, just, you know, working for the state, um, but, you know, needing that income, but also knowing that I am helping those babies and the, that are going to start coming into custody, you know, um, the children that come into foster care, that number is going to rise. And, you know, we're already limited on caseworkers that um, want to work for Children's Division, um, foster parents. Um, I'm, I'm honored to be on here. Um, this is the first time that I've ever engaged in anything like this. Um, so thank you very much. Holly, we are so glad to have you here uh, and everyone else too. And we love this conversation. Uh, I did see a question in the chat from Alyssa. Uh, she says, how or will can this impact confidentiality when working with clients? Any thoughts on that? And I, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but we do have two members of our ethics committee with us tonight, Pat and Daria. So I don't know if one of you would like to take that. Daria, it looks like you're on mute. I sent you an ask to, uh, I, I sent you a request, Daria. Sent me a request, okay. Um, so can maybe repeat the question? I'm a little, I didn't quite get it. So she's uh, asking how this impacts confidenti confidentiality when working with clients. So like, you know, and we have people from all over the country. So like if, you know, someone's disclosing something to them as I'm thinking what, what she's talking about. I, I got you. Pat, do you want to weigh in on this too, on confidentiality? I mean, I'm not really sure how that's going to impact confidentiality. I, I have to be honest. I, I don't know how any of this is going to impact us. It's it's also new. Yeah, we have ethical responsibilities to the people we're working with. And we will still have ethical responsibilities as part of our professional, um, our professional code of ethics. But it may, in fact, be in conflict with the law. And these are decisions that people have to think about across the line. Um, you may want to familiarize yourself with your licensing law at this moment, even if you haven't gotten the fine points of it until now. 
Um, but I think groups like this are going to have to keep talking to each other because we're going to be facing specific. Um, I know our colleague just mentioned um, using laws about trafficking and um, child abuse, but I think some people have used that in the other direction already. And there's a potential for that happening. And I think this is going to be a time, this is a great time for you to re-rehearse, read what you're obligated to do on behalf of your clients, on behalf of your agency, and then come to decisions before you start facing this because all of us are going to face it one way or the other. Um, I'm very interested in, in what the clinicians on the line are thinking or if they've already had cases where they've come up against this. I'm very interested to hear what you have to say. I, I just wanna piggyback on what Pat just said that I think as social workers, our clients come first at all times. And sometimes what we need to do may fly in the face of the law. So I think what's important is to understand what's happening in each of our states legally and then think about our code of ethics. Hi, um, I just, um, my name's Nicole Hedis, um, and I just, just kind of, I'm digesting all this and a lot of stuff really kind of, couple of things triggered me. One thing that I had thought about when this first started happening was I immediately made sure that I had liability insurance. I'm fairly new to the profession, but you know, this is just something that's come up more and more. And with everything, you know, kind of thinking about how this is happening and how the, you know, conflicting between our profession and what the law is, you know, I just, the first thing that I thought of is I have to make sure that I have liability insurance and what all that covers and to make sure that I'm okay if something was to happen, you know, have that insurance, insurance to back me up. Um, and the other thing too, when it comes up with reproductive, I got triggered with that, you know, some of the things where like what Felix was talking about, um, I am a child-free woman. I have um, part of a Facebook group that's also, you know, child-free and that the whole thing of everyone hurrying up to either get uh, um, snipped, you know, like the guys call it, oh, I need to hurry up and get snipped because I want to make sure, you know, my partner doesn't become pregnant because I really want to be child-free and I don't want her to get pregnant or versus uh, being, a, you know, child-free woman making sure that, you know, we're of, uh, you know, we're just making sure that you don't get pregnant. So you're like having to hurry up and make those decisions. And then the whole dilemma of the doctors agreeing with you to go ahead and do a hysterectomy. Everyone's battling that right now. I know for myself, I suffered um, from endometriosis for a number of years, 15, 20 years. And time and time again, I suffered for so long because doctors would not do a hysterectomy on me. I had doctors tell me, are you, I know you want a hysterectomy, but is your husband okay with this? Are you kidding me? I'm the one that's in severe pain that is affecting my livelihood of going to work and also just severe pain, my quality of life but they just continued to push back until I finally got a doctor to agree that yes, I could make that decision for myself. Didn't have to ask my husband, but I, it's just, so that kind of triggered me <laughs> when you're talking about how everyone's trying to, you know, now if they weren't gonna make that decision because of the whole reproductive system, you know, how if you have a full hysterectomy, like now I have to be on estrogen and all that jazz, um, and so now people are going to have to make those decisions. Like I wasn't going to plan on having a hysterectomy, but now I'm going to see if I can hurry up and do this. Um, so I just wanted to share that with you guys because I, it's like this whole thing that's happening and, oh gosh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank, thank you guys.
No, don't be sorry at all. Um, thank you for sharing um, your speaking to and some other folks have been speaking to like the systems that we're working in, right? So it's like these legal systems, the, these political systems um, and systems that promote you know, these different ideologies, patriarchy being one of them of like, you need your husband's permission and kind of gets to down to the issue of, and the fight for reproductive rights and autonomy, right? That one should be making their own decision, their own um, decisions to their own body. Um, whether it's to carry a pregnancy, whether it's to have an abortion, whatever it is. Um, and then also um, there was this other thing that came up in the conversation right now, but I just wanted to, to make uh, a point that oftentimes I think as social workers um, and just also as, as folks, we can see there may be a disconnect in like the law and like what like, you know, should be our ethical um, obligations or what we should be doing. So I, I just want to like echo what um, Daria and Pat have been saying and like doing your research and building community of folks that are either in your organizations or in your states that, um, you know, um, are looking into these issues or can kind of research how, you know, um, you can kind of protect yourselves and protect your patients and your communities. Um, because I, there's going to be, I think there is going to be where we're going to see, we're already seeing it with healthcare providers that may be criminalized with providing abortions. So this may be something that can affect specifically our micro social workers. So um, just wanted to echo that as well. Um, and it's unfortunate oftentimes, um, you know, there is like this disconnect between the legal um, and what we, what we should be doing as social workers. But um, I know Patricia, you've been having your hand up um, for a while. So let's go to you um, and then we'll go to Melody and then Robert. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm still thinking about what Gladys just said um, before I kind of go into what I was going to say. Um, I definitely, that definitely did resonate with me with the whole child free situation, navigating that. Um, so, first of all, I want to say, as several people have mentioned here, you know, thank you so much for um, having this space to process this. I'm, I'm really appreciative that there are a lot of folks from the South on this call um, so I can get some sense of community. Um, so, I'm from Northwest Arkansas, or I'm currently living in Northwest Arkansas. I'm originally from Jersey. Um, most of my family is in the Jersey, New York area. Um, but I've been living here for the past three years, and it's been really, really horrible in terms of just the macro level, um, in terms of laws and things like that, that have been already restricting folks. Um, I am a clinician of color. Um, I specialize in working with diverse um, groups, including LGBTQ laws, and I know that um, in the months before leading up to this, there have been a slew of anti-trans laws, and there is a technically a law that was passed last year, which basically gives medical providers the right to discriminate against folks based for moral reasons. Um, so that's in the book, and so that was definitely written intentionally um, for trans folks um, in denying them access to gender um, affirming um, surgery. And I think that's kind of the ends of like protecting the children. Um, and I also work for the state and I also work for college students. And I, I'm appreciative of this space because I don't even know if I have the opportunity to talk about how this has been impacting not only my clients, but myself particularly um, in places like that, because I think Northwest Arkansas is the headquarters of Walmarts. And so there's huge companies like Walmart, J.B. Hunt, Tyson, and they definitely have a grab and hold of like what's happening in the state and what's happening in the college there. Um, and just noticing kind of like someone mentioned in Missouri was like one of the first, I feel like if Missouri was the first, we were the second uh, to kind of have that trigger law um, passed. Um, and with Sarah Huckabee Sanders in the running uh, to being the governor of the state, um, there's also kind of laws being passed or anticipation of laws that are restricting diversity, equity, inclusion efforts in education. Um, so I feel like this is kind of a buildup of me kind of really evaluating um, my place in the state and if I'm able to practice and do some of the things that I want to do. Um, but in the meantime, in terms of ethics and values, I, I definitely agree that, you know, clients, and in my case, students come first. And if someone's coming to me, they want information about, you know, how to access a, you know, abortion provider, which for us, the closest is Illinois, uh, which is very far away. Um, I will give folks that. But I also know that, and I remember talking about this with, a, with clients about, you know, the, the awareness of their privilege. As some people know that they have the ability to travel outside of states to do that. 
whereas there are many people that don't. Um, so yeah, huge financial barriers and things like that. And I think it's interesting that now there's articles released about like the impact of this in college mental health, um, particularly because a majority of abortions, I think they said were like people in their twenties. So that's a significant portion of folks. And so I wonder how to navigate these conversations in the historically conservative state that's probably doesn't really realize how much people need these services and how much people use it because it's kind of like we don't talk about it um, and we smile and we make sure that everything's okay. Um, so I'm, I'm sitting with that. Um, but I do appreciate, you know, once again, having this space and having the support of people from many different states and things like that and to talk about this really openly. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Patricia. Um, like you said, people are going to be getting abortions. Um, what's now going to be changing is the access to the safe and legal abortions. And this is to like disproportionately going to affect people of low income, um, people that are BIPOC associated um, that won't have the opportunities to travel out of state um, um, and may need to go online to get pills mailed to them, X, Y, Z. There's a whole host of issues and legal questions um, and a lot of unknown in that sense as, as well. Like, what can I do? How can I not get, um, you know, punished or like state sanctioned, even though I want to get this care and I like, you know, um, so, so yeah, um, and then also the, the political landscape, right? Conservative towns or red states, but also like these are issues that are coming up in blue states, right? Um, and um, so I wanna, so I wanna pay attention to that. And it, you mentioned uh, quickly like this, um, like m many abortions happen in their twenties and a lot of people, there's a lot of uh, misinformation or like th these ideas that are associated with abortions and who gets abortions, but many people that get abortions um, are moms, um, but that's not, you know, what we hear. So that's another layer to this. Um, so wanted to throw all of that out there. Thank you for sharing and pass it off to Melody. Thank you so much. No Melody, on Matsua, no hope yet. Um... Good afternoon from Tucson, Arizona. I'm Melody Lopez, MSW, and Arizona is purple as we are both uh, red and blue. I feel like we get the worst of both parties here though, so purple isn't really a beautiful color. I think what is concerning for me as a social worker is the uncertainty of it all. And so I'm super grateful for this forum because <clears throat> My experience of what happened was the fall of Ro Roe v. Wade, the fall of the McGirt decision in Oklahoma, which deeply impacted how tribes are treated and the ability to be able to function as our, the sovereign nations that we are. And then also, I know for some people this is a stretch, but not for me, the Clean Water Act was repealed because for me, violence against the earth and violence against women are intertwined. And so these three things really just knocked the wind out of me. I'm literally sitting here with a head wrap on my head with a migraine because I need to feel the kinship allowed in this group. But it's the uncertainty of, my God, Indian Child Welfare Act is up next. And these people, the trans rights, oh dear gosh. All the things are just up for it right now. And I don't want to feel so unempowered that I don't take action because part of me just really, part of me really wants to just retreat. I just like, oh my God, this is too much. You know, but I'm a social worker. You know, we have to take that front line. That's, that's part, for me, I have to, I sure, shouldn't put that on you. I became a social worker to take that front line. I became a social worker so that I would be engaging before the social injustice were put together as one concept. That's what I was there to do. And so I'm still the loss though with what shoe to drop. But I did see in chat and I'm really glad um, my hand's been up for a little while, but someone mentioned that we know this is about power and control. I work in domestic violence. I work in sexual assault. Let me tell you, the lack of abortion care for those individuals involved in those relationships, so horrifying you all. That Friday, 
was just a horrible bleak day in the domestic violence sexual assault community. You know, I just, I'm still recovering, but I feel like I'm ready for the, I'm ready for the fight to come. I think right now I'm just kind of building armor by being here. And I'm just really grateful again for this space. And I think the thing that's getting me most again is the lack, what next? I'm confused, what's happening? Where do I focus my energies? I'm really glad Felix began with this intersectional conversation because that's what it's gonna take. It's gonna take a lot of listening to each other and understanding and really taking that front line on all of these issues, which is really hard, you know, and it's exhausting. And I don't know when we're gonna see self-care again, but thank you for having this forum. Thank you for speaking. Um, and there was a lot that you just provided us. Um, so I wanna, I wanna thank you for that. Um, yeah. Um, so also I wanted to add, and you, you talked about it, Melody, but um, if folks have also been maybe thinking of ways of what can we, like, how can we go from here? How can we um, transform it, some of these emotions if we are at that, if we are at that place yet, um, and try to mobilize either within your own organizations, within your own state or at, at a national level, and also with the New York State um, chapter. Um, and if there are any thoughts that you have, I want to also open up this conversation to what do you all think that we should be doing um, as an NASW chapter? Um, and how do we go from here? Um, um, so let me pass it off to Janet and friend. Hi, um, my name is Cassandra Hussey. We're in Texas. We're in the Austin Metroplex. Um, and so, so this really, um, for me personally, I'll go, well, let me just tell you, I'm a clinical social worker and I'm also a certified sex therapist with the ASACT. Um, so on a personal note, a couple of weeks before the draft leak of the Supreme Court, I actually experienced my own abortion. And so I, this was really triggering for me in a sense of even knowing that, um, sorry, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so recognizing going through my own experience and recognizing the lack of support that's out there for abortion um, in the first place, um, really felt sad because it what what people experience and what or at least what I experienced and I imagine a lot of other people experience is disenfranchised grief grief that we're not allowed to have and grief that's stigmatized and so when the draft leak came out like we it's like we knew that this was going to happen and we just weren't ready to really know how this was going to feel until it happened um so with my sadness and my rage that came from that, I really felt empowered to then, I was like, I have to do something. So um, because I recognized that there was such a lack of resources out there that didn't have like an underlying religious agenda uh, from post-abortion support, I decided to find resources out there that were more affirming towards abortion, minimizing any, like without any shame behind it. And so I recognized in, um, I'm in a lot of therapist groups a lot around Texas on Facebook, and a lot of people were asking questions like, well, what do we do? What are the resources out there? So with my rage empowerment, I decided to create, um, like just bring all of the resources in, and I shared it across the Texas um, Facebook groups that, I'm, that I have access to. So anywhere, all the, from your options, like abortion options to transportation and funding to post abortion support. Um, so that's what I did. And I also, because of recognizing that there is such lack of support out there, I launched abortion affirming therapy, of course, it, with a solution focused lens around disenfranchised grief. So that's what, how I'm planning on supporting people in the Texas community. Um, also planning on getting licensed in other states so that I can support people in other states as well. Um, and I'm just, 
I guess my biggest concern right now is the concern of being like aiding and abetting that, or I don't know where Texas is going to be going with this. Um, but as of right now, there are no laws that I've found. So I'm really looking forward. Like right now, I'm just focusing on the present and like helping people where I can in this moment. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Janet Tui. I have been a social worker for over 25 years and having a proud moment because Cassandra is my former supervisee. So I'm really proud of her and how far she's come and, and her growth. Um, for me, um, I'm super concerned about the dystopian future that may be lying ahead of us. Um, if anybody has ever seen Handmaid's Tale, I feel like this is just a step in that direction, maybe even a giant leap in that direction. And, you know, am I, I'm enraged that they're trying to legislate females' bodies on top of the fact that they are not even trying to legislate men at all, even though they are part of this equation. No, it shouldn't happen in the first place, but nobody's talking about that. Why are they not being held accountable? Because I think if you started holding them accountable, the laws might change. In fact, I um, have seen Lima Bowie, and if all of you have know who Lima Bowie is, she's the 2011 Nobel Peace Prize laureate who is a social worker in Liberia. I would like to say that we should do a sex strike like she did in her country. Two weeks, the sex strike was there and they changed the country for just two weeks of, of sex strike. You know, and so it's just thoughts that we can do something, um, a word, a phrase, a word that I learned from Patch Adams, <clears throat> which I think is fabulous, is perturbate. And I think we need to perturb the system. That's social work was founded on grassroots. And I'm personally, and this is just me speaking, not everybody is in this position, but I'm thankful that I am in this position, that if need be, I will go to jail if I have to if I need to protect my clients or, or even other people's rights. That's just, um, I'm prepared to do that and I'm okay with that. I will say orange is the new bat black and we'll keep on going because this is not okay and we need to let them know it's not okay in one way or another. Um, the other point that I would like to um, share is that, you know, we want to um, gather additional people to help us. So we can't just stop here. We can't just be just social workers. Who else do we bring in and having some type of round table? I went, I had a client and this is important for people to know who got pregnant because young child, young child, everybody college level, um, where she got pregnant because her psych meds counteracted her birth control. And even though she was warned by her psychiatrist, being young, not thinking anything of it, she ended up getting pregnant. Of course, she ended up with abortion um, because she wasn't ready to be a mother at that time. That's why she was on birth control. She was doing all the right things. When we had a, um, a, a gathering before the Roe v. Wade, a doctor, an OBGYN came up and said, she had a woman in her office who had a stillborn and she could not perform you know, the abortion because of the laws and I don't know, and Cassandra, you might know this, but at one point they were talking about anybody could sue a social worker, healthcare provider, et cetera, for 10,000 in Texas, if they were, even if they were out of state, if we knew about it and didn't report it. And so, you know what, not doing it, I don't care. And so that's why, you know, we're team, our team is here. So thank you for putting this on, whoever, got this together. I've always been a proud member of NASW. Thank you, Janet. And thank you, Cassandra. Um, you guys talked about a lot. Um, and it also makes me think that um, there are a lot of good things, positive things that are happening in this tragedy with state coalitions that are being built and mobilization that's happening. So um, maybe we can use the chat as well to share, you know, some of those organizations as well for folks um, that are either surrounding us or within our within um, our state, um, just to just to build up those resources for for everyone. Um, I'll I'll pass it off to Austin. 
Hello, my name is Austin. I use he, him, and they, them pronouns, and I'm currently an MSW student in Detroit, Michigan. And actually, I was doing orientation for my social work program while the information about Roe v. Wade came out. And I was, it was just so fear invoking because being a part of the trans community and it was just all day on my socials it was there was just no intersectionality where I was fearful for my sisters and my siblings but I was also fearful for the other people in my community who might lack access to inclusive health care that can't even try to go to an OBGYN if they needed to because of them transitioning or their identity. And it was heartbreaking to see some of the different organizations that I followed and really respected did not look at the inclusive aspect of what was going on with Roe v. Wade and how it also affects other minorities as well and not just women. And I'm working with some individuals to find resources for people within the community that we live in that can give birth or that could get pregnant. And it's finding resources for women as well as people that can get pregnant that are LGBT resources. Because even though a place might be an abortion access, that might not mean that they're also inclusive to LGBT individuals. So you don't want to be sending LGBT individuals to a place that's going to dehumanize them at the same time. So it's just so much more work to try to find places that won't dehumanize all individuals at the same time. That's that's the end of mine. Sorry. No, don't don't apologize. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I don't know what the landscape in Michigan is looking like, but that is a really big challenge. Um, so I don't know if folks have suggestions for Austin um, or possible resources, um, but it's a good point of, you know, when we are trying to find these clinics and well, I'll at the end of maybe in like 30 minutes, I'll also share some some links um, and organizations where um, folks may be able to turn to um, for additional support for their patients. Um, but sometimes, you know, another reality that folks are hitting is that some places will th say that they are a clinic supporting pregnant people or whatever, and, and you go into those clinics, and those may be clinics where they are trying to convince you to keep this abortion, uh, to keep this pregnancy, um, and, you know, doing more harm, um, and they kind of like try to trap you in that way, um, and impose this idea of religion and something like that, or, you know, things things that can come up, which is super, super dangerous. Um, but that's another reality that we're seeing also. Um, so um, I'll pass it off to Felix. Um, and again, if folks kind of wanna talk about what, what's coming up for them and also if things that are happening within their, their own respective works that are working are um, best practices um, that can be useful to other people and you know um, challenges that they've been facing, um, please share those as well. Yeah, so I have a lot of thoughts. I like literally wrote notes and things. Um, and I might have to leave soon for to get myself some food. So I wanted to just get every all my thoughts down first. Um, something that Austin made me think about, um, like he's a student, and I remember when I was student, a student in my um ESW and MSW programs, which was not too long ago. I'm a relatively new practitioner, like I graduated in 2021. So I remember specifically we had like a case vignette in which they asked us, like it was essentially like, oh, there's a 15 year old in your office who um, is uh, pregnant, wants an abortion and doesn't wanna tell her parents about it. Um, and then the question was like, what would you do? Would you provide her service? Um, like that kind of question. And I just specifically remember the professor didn't tell the, like I had 
two, one, one or two people on my table who said, I would not see that person because I don't believe in abortion. I'm like, oh my God, why are you becoming a social worker? So some, uh, something that I think that needs to immediately happen is we need to be training our upcoming social workers, not only in intersectional social work, but also in social work that's specifically talking about like human rights, like abortion as a human right. And I think that at least the people that I, you know, graduated with, some of them are still very anti-abortion. And to me, that's a problem. Um, I think that professors need to nip that in the butt when they're like educating. Um, And uh, speaking of education, I think that especially for uh, like therapists or like, and and direct uh, like contact workers who are working with populations who you might, I think it's our imperative, like we're not medical doctors, but it's important for us to know certain things so that we can call them out in our clients. For example, it's important for me to know that um, uh, a trans masculine client on testosterone can still get pregnant even if they don't have a period. And this is really important with Roe v. Wade, right? Because if you don't have a period, you might not even know you're pregnant. And a nightmare scenario scenario for me is to suddenly wake up and I'm like six or seven months pregnant without me realizing it because I don't get a period. So it's so important if you have um, like trans clients on testosterone who are engaging in activities that could get them pregnant for them to know that they could get pregnant. And I think that like just having those kind of offhand knowledge is really important for all social workers to have. Um, And that extends to like other kind of sex education things too. Um, And I think like the other thing with for clinical people, again, I'm, I'm a new clinician and Right, but I think it's really important that we figure out how to discreetly talk about certain things. And before when abortion was readily, theoretically readily available for most people, it wouldn't be too horrible to write in your notes, like client is you know, healing from the emotional turmoil of getting an abortion. Now, I think a lot of people have to start really cutting out those all of the details is we have to be much more discreet. And I would argue, especially in states that are starting to enact a lot of trans laws, like I think in Missouri is trying, literally trying to pass right now uh, a ban on transitioning for trans adults, not just tr- trans kids, but trans adults. So in states like that, and probably a lot of other states too, we have to start considering if. We want to be writing down things like client is considering HRT. Like that might be a safety thing too. And I think that's something that we really have to think about. Um, And then onto like something that I wanted to uh, highlight in the comments that was, it's actually a while back now, but Bonnie had said in the comments sometime before I pointed out um, that if we're going to compare our dystopian reality to dystopian fiction, we should turn to things like Parable of the Sower um, by Octavia Butler, because things like The Handmaid's Tale is essentially, um, we only care about it because it's happening to white women, but all of these things in The Handmaid's Tale have historically happened to black and brown women in our country. And for us to like, fictionalize their experience and give it to white women and then now we all care about it I think is really (laughs) problematic in the way that we think about stuff Um, which brings me to my next point which is like the the narratives around this issue is like people are shocked about Roe v. Wade, but you know, black and brown women have been organizing around this for years. Like we knew about it, right? Um, And people are horrified and a lot of, and I'm gonna talk really racially. And if you like, I want people, especially white women to listen, I guess, um, and like hear what I'm trying to say, but not everybody is the leader of the movement. Right. I think that we need to support 
the people who are working already, and that is BIPOC women in organizations like the National Abortion Fund that are already doing the work. Like we do not have to be our own like like leader of the movement fantasy people, right? Like we're we got to listen to people who are already doing the work. And I think as social workers, that's really important. We can be support people. Like some people are at the front and some people are, you know, in the back supporting other people or doing support work or even handing out food, whatever. You don't have to glorify the revolution because it's messy and horrible. And it's certainly like, um, when we place ourselves at the center, we often forget all of the actual pieces that people who have done this for a long time already know about. So I think it's really important for us to, to listen more than we just like run into it. But I understand the urgency. If you're feeling urgency, <laughs> but you weren't feeling urgency uh, six months ago, then I think that's a pretty good sign that maybe you should pause and then research how you can support people already doing the work. Um, and then the last thing that I wanna say is something that I've really been working on um, in my, not only in my personal life, but also as a therapist to people who are feeling really upset. And I'm upset, I think everyone's upset. Um, I think we need to uh, utilize something that is called revolutionary joy, right? Being, um, hopeful about what we can accomplish together through community is incredibly important in this time. We cannot isolate ourselves, we cannot be rash, and we cannot lose hope because that's what they want us to do. They want us to fall into despair. Um, a really good book on this is actually on abolition and transformative justice um, that talks a lot about the importance of hope. And the author of that book is uh, Maryam Kaba. And she says that this quote, you might've seen it on the internet is um, let this radicalize you instead of putting like making you fall into despair. And I think that's incredibly important right now. I think like we need to be focusing on obviously reproductive justice, but utilizing techniques and like theories from black and brown women like abolition, like transformative justice, like all of these things, like again, an intersectional movement. And I just say that because I think that our scope is too small. And I really hope that this lands, like I wanna say this gently, but like, I do not think in our um, culture, something like a sex strike will be useful. Partly because not all of us who are affected by abortion sleep with people who could get us pregnant. Also, some of us who sleep with people who, if you, you, if you withhold sex, that means you might get raped, right? It, it means you have, um, you're exposing yourself to violence when you withhold sex from someone. And that's an individual action. I think we need to be looking bigger. I think we need to be encouraging people to not lose hope. I think we need to be financially and supporting and uplifting um, systems that are already here. Um, and if you think that you like um, can't, like there's nothing to do, there's, there's everything to do. We can continue to do stuff um, and we don't have to run away and move out just because for the first time, if you're a white woman and this is the first time things are affecting you, like our laws, maybe like you need to stay here and work on it, right? Because people have been doing this work for a long time. And I guess like, I am feeling frustrated and I'm trying to be yes. hopeful. Like I'm trying to be hopeful, but like, I just, I think I have a lot of anger and I think that um, I really don't know uh, where to go from there or, or how to, like, I think I want to close it up into a little bow, but this is going to be a little messy for a while. At least my feelings are messy about it for a while, and I think that's okay. 
just want to give a moment for that. And processing all of that, Felix, thank you for everything that you said. I think anger is completely valid. Anger is true. Anger is real. Um, I am angry. Um, and also, um, I think there's a lot of people in the room that agree with you. And um, a lot of what you shared is what's re resonating. And um, just from a lot of what's happening in the chat, um, I can speak like I'm think I'm thankful that you've shared all of that you shared. Um, reproductive justice and the movement for reproductive rights um, was founded uh, and this ideology was founded by black women um, and control and harm and dangers have been happening to black bodies since, you know, 500, 400 years ago, since like before slavery. Um, so like you said, hands my tail. A lot of people are talking about it on social and stuff like that, but that's been a living reality for a lot of specifically black women for centuries. Um, and now it's more universal. And you know, you have the idea that I wanna echo and uplift and honor also is the, the idea of wanting to do something. And I think rap, a lot of folks are being radicalized right now, right? Um, because a lot, of, a lot of rights are being undermined um, and um, people that may not be in this work, um, this, this is news to a lot of people and shock um, and being radicalized is great, um, but also we need to kind of self-reflect and be conscious of what we're doing and how we're doing it. So if folks are acting in urgency, I wanna echo what Felix had said and doing the research of who's, who's already doing the work um, and that this idea of urgency, um, I think Patricia had said it in the chat, um, is directly connected to supremacy and this idea of capitalism, right? Um, and those are systems that, you know, are not effective, have not been effective and do more harm and coalition building, supporting our communities, working with adjacent with our communities, with our patients is kind of what we need to be doing. And also moving away from like the second wave of feminism and this idea of like savioristic mentality of like, you know, like I, I need to do something. Well, maybe you need to like kind of sit back and reflect and um, kind of send, send those emails, like do like the back office work and let the people that are leading lead. Um, and last thing I need, I want to say is like you said, abortion is a human right. And also I want to uplift and say abortion is also healthcare as well um, for folks. Um, so Danielle, I want to pass it off to you. Hello, I'm Danielle. I um, probably should have taken a lesson from Felix and made notes. Um, so I'm gonna try not to be all over the place. Um, but I um, just moved to New York from Georgia, which is a purple state only because of things like gerrymandering. Um, and I think um, coming from that, environment um, where <laughs> coming from that environment, I think where people um, are fighting for rights every day, I think the hardest part about everything that is going on right now is like that helpless feeling um, because, you know, you hear a lot of like, well, you need to get out there and vote. You need to contact your uh, senators. You need to, you know, go to this uh, protest. And I feel like in a community that, and, you know, a social work community that have been doing that for a very long time, and it's part of who we are as people and professionals, um, you know, just asking us to do those things harder is not not really, doesn't really feel empowering. Um, and um, I think personally, um, we, you know, we, we heard from some people who, you know, are childless, would like to remain childless, but I am a mom of four <laughs> and, you know, accessing some of those same, um, you know, reproductive health care has been very difficult for me as well. Um, and so I just, you know, want to stand in solidarity with everyone <laughs> that um, in 2017, I had an IUD fail and I got pregnant 
<laughs> a very unwanted pregnancy, but my, um, you know, getting that access to um, healthcare and um, it was very difficult for me. And then for my spouse who was uh, de denied a vasectomy until the outcome right. of that pregnancy, it was, um, you know, I, I, th I think the, the issues are bigger. Um, you know, the number one um, cause of death for pregnant people is homicide. That's right, hey, bro. The, um, you know, the United States has the highest maternal mortality rate in like Western nations. Uh, pregnancy is very, very dangerous for um, even people who want children and who, you know, have other children. Um, and uh, then when you throw other uh, potential complications on top of it, um, not only is accessing uh, healthcare very difficult for a lot of people, but it's also very expensive. And um, I think you have, um, you know, a, a lot of um, overlapping issues, um, you know, with medical um, justice, with, um, you know, violence against um, women and, you know, people who can get pregnant. I think um, it is, um, I think um, it's, it's not just about abortion. And I think we have to get uh, a bigger picture, I think, when we're moving ahead in social work and um, and how do we do that? And um, I, th I think if we just focus on, um, you know, the Dobbs decision on the overturning of Roe v. Wade, we've, we've missed the big picture. Thank you, Danielle, for sharing. Um, I want to do a time check for folks. Um, um, to honor um, everyone's time, um, and then also pass it off to Eva. I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, and then also have a question for folks um, um, as as people continue to process. Um, but curious if folks have advice for each other on what's helping them continue to sustain in the work that they are doing or how they are serving. Um, and working alongside their peers, um, and um, you know, any any best practices or um, any ideas that folks want to share um, that may that may be helpful um, for for this group. Um, so with that, I'll pass it off to you. Hello. Good oh, Eva, I think you uh, by accident muted yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, great, thank you. Great, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, my name is Yvette. I'm an MSW, um, currently residing in the Cucumie Islands, which is San Diego, California. Um, I am a co-founder and for the Siwapakli Collective, and we are based out of Phoenix, Arizona, so Purple State, um, doing work around the, primarily the Southwest region, but mostly in Arizona. We mostly serve um, Latinx and urban indigenous folks. Um, and we work with, um, sorry, my little one is crying. I should have started with, I'm a mom of two spare babies and two um, littles. And I wanted to really thank Felix for bringing um, to the forefront the conversation around this practice. Um, of reproductive rights and abortion always being in our communities and how important it is to redistribute some of these resources to grassroots organizations and community organizations and promotoras, community health workers, doulas that have been doing this work in our, in our black and brown communities for a really long time because um, abortion is healthcare, but it's, it's also a luxury for some folks to be able to go and afford it. And so we really do try to, um, we have doulas that are full spectrum doulas that provide um, abortion support, 
uh, for home abortions um, in a very holistic, we try to do in a very spiritual way that honors how difficult a decision this is for a, a, a person with, with a womb, a birthing parent. Um, I myself have had to have two terminations and one was um, because of circumstances and the other one was to save my life. And so um, it's really important to remember that community has always been there for, for marginalized folks. Um, doesn't matter what, what color we are, you know, um, and, and our, uh, what spectrum of our uh, sexual identity we fall on, it's always been community that supports each other. And one of our biggest challenges is that um, we're often overlooked because we're not part of these institutions because we function differently, because a lot of our um, communities have trauma and we're scared to, to access. And there's so much fear right now within our communities um, because of Roe v. Wade and not just because of that lack of access to abortion, but just all of the other rights that are um, being threatened as well. And so I love, you know, being able to ask, you know, how can we support the work of that is, has historically been done? How can we, um, a lot of us struggle, I'll have to say our organization struggles with legal representation and navigating this new realm. Um, we've always sort of worked underground with what we do and now we have to be more discreet and we've, you know, uh, we're in collaboration with other doula collectives that have the same fears. And, um, and then also remembering how can we continue to honor our two spirit relatives because this isn't, we've always been here. And like you said, abortion is a human right. And um, yeah, I, I don't know if I have anything else to add, but I really just appreciate um, everything that Felix shared and felt really, um, I've, this is my first time attending something like this. And I appreciate um, that some of the, it, I feel less alone with some of the feelings that we have been navigating as a small organization um, and I hope that there's more of these as, cause I there have a very strong feeling that this is just a, the beginning of a very long fight. So thank you. It's an honor. Thank you for the work that you are doing on the ground, um, and for joining. There's so much that's happened, um, and with a lot of folks sharing both, um, off mute and in the chat. So I think we need we may need to do a part two of this uh, because I don't want the conversation conversation to drop and it's so lively. Um, so um, I wanna do I do want to take a moment to um, share some resources because I know um, a lot of people have been um, kind of like talking about and considering what do I do how can I help. Um, so let me let me share my screen um, and we'll send you this over email as well. Um, but these are specifically with respect to um, abortion and what's happening um, with the climate in different states right now. Um, this is kind of a quick list of where you can kind of support through um, financial, uh, through providing financial, um, you know, support doing financial support. Um, so first you can directly support abortion funds. Um, I, North Dakota has one clinic, um, the Red River w Women's Clinic, that's getting really specific in North Dakota. Um, but to identify where, what clinics are either in your state or around your state, um, please Google the National Network for Abortion Funds, and they have a list of funds that are um, both national and state-based, um, and you can directly um, put your money to, to those um, funds. Also, in addition to funds, there are independent clinics that serve um, around three of five folks that get abortions. Um, so independent clinics are 
the majority of the setting where people get abortions as opposed to in a um, healthcare provider setting or whatnot. Um, so definitely would recommend supporting directly supporting independent clinics. The Abortion Care Network is a national organization that supports those um, various clinics across the country. And if you want to identify where there may be a clinic around your um, local area, you can Google Key Bar Clinics and they'll give you a listserv as well for that. Um, we, we didn't really talk about it as much today, um, but there's a lot of this concern and issue about criminality and who's going to be crim uh, criminalized um, and how that may come about and where how we will be able to see it. So I definitely urge folks, um, if they're interested in that and want to support, to um, support reproductive legal defense organizations, if one how is a really great one um, that to uh, that does direct legal representation for people that um, are being put into the criminal system, uh, the legal system, because of either anything during their preg pregnancy or because of um, a self-managed abortion. National Advocates for Pregnant Women, um, we also provide legal defense um, in various states because of anything that the state is considering as harm um, to, to you know, this idea of an unborn or a fetus. Um, and then also, and also for folks, if they're curious, if when how has a hotline as well. Um, so that may be a, another resource um, as well. If you have questions um, about how to um, questions around confidentiality or ways to provide the best uh, care uh, for your patients. And then I would definitely recommend researching and looking into different grassroots or grass tops organizations, um, specifically ones that have been engaged in this work for 20 plus years um, and that are BIPOC led. Sister Song is one of them. Um, and they're a really great one um, that works to kind of continue and ensure that we, this is not a hot topic that we are working on, on just today, but um, donating to an organization like that can help sustain the movement for years to come. So we wanna ensure that we're, we're being able to do that as well. Black Mamas Matter Alliance is another one. And then also various groups within states um, that focus on providing doula care, midwife care as well. Um, so this is a general listserv. Um, if folks have others, please share them in the chat. I, I know I'm missing a lot, um, but uh, we'll share this out as well. And then I think we can pull different ones that folks have been seeing in the chat as well and sharing those out. Um, and then I wanted to also, let me let me stop sharing the screen so I can see you all. Um, I also wanted to share that we are going, um, the National Advocates for Pregnant Women and NASW New York State chapter um, will, it is right now in the in the works of planning an event um, tailored to uh, social workers um, and possible complicity within specifically the child welfare system um, when it comes to um, mandated reporting um, and how to basically work in that system or confront that system to ensure that um, their clients are getting the care that they need and not being pulled in either the um, family policing system, which we call the family policing system, but is anonymous, um, syn synonymous for the child welfare system or the criminal system. So um, we'll be providing practical guidelines for social workers that are we either working adjacent or in those systems um, because criminality is going to increase, unfortunately, for all people with capacity for pregnancy, what's happening while Roe was on the books is going to in increase now without the protections of Roe. Um, so please look out um, in your emails for that event, and then we'll continue to continue this conversation. So um, you know, just just be on alert um, from NASW as well. Um, thank you everyone for being here, for um, participating in every way that you have been and being present, sharing your vulnerability, your emotions. Um, it's been a lot. I am so happy that there's this much of you that have turned out on this Thursday evening. Um, and I really do believe that there is power in community and that's how we can go forward um, and make sure that, um, you know, we are um, helping each other and continuing to ensure that um, rights for all are intact. Um, so with that, um, we'll leave you. Sam, please jump in if there's any logistical things. Um, and yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Afsha. You did an amazing job as always facilitating this conversation. And I just want to let you know that we see that there's a need for this in this conversation to continue. I want to thank Brenda 
uh, my counterpart in Kentucky for joining us. And then we also had Nicole, who is with the Texas chapter with us tonight. And we want to continue to work with our, our, our people who are in those red states to make sure that we can support you all and that we continue to gather like this and continue these conversations. So we will be speaking with Afsha tomorrow to try to find a date in August that works for everyone. And then we'll get that scheduled as soon as we can. And I know that Amelia, you'll also be sending out the recording and the resources we gather tonight. And thank you, Bonnie, for, for putting those resources in at the end, like 40 pages of resources. Amelia, did you want to add anything? No, just want to thank everyone for joining us. And we look forward to, uh, I took some notes while everyone was speaking. And I think that we have uh, many things that we will be working on within the next week to provide to social workers, members, and non-members. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Good to see all our friends, too. It's nice seeing all of you we haven't seen in a while here tonight.